Hi, I'm Teresa Martin from Lower Cape TV, and welcome to the second season of Minds of Summer, produced in partnership with the Cape Cod Institute, which brings leading thinkers and doers from around the world to its renowned week-long workshops right here on the Outer Cape. Event after tragic event pits them against us. Race, gender, age, ethnicity, regionality, religion, the list of ways we divide ourselves seems endless sometimes. If it weren't so deadly serious, it would almost seem silly. After all, aren't we all the same humans? Yet from tiny daily conflicts to acts of terror and war, them versus us seems to lurk within. With me today is Dr. Deborah Plummer. Dr. Plummer is the Vice Chancellor and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where she leads the center's diversity initiatives. In addition, as a professor in the departments of psychiatry and quantitative health sciences, her research explores racial identity, and her guidebook, Advancing Inclusion, offers both questions and solutions to this thorny area of us versus them. Welcome, Dr. Plummer. Thank you so much. Well, let me start by asking this. Can you give us a status report on where we are with them versus us? as the human species. It uh, seems to be an area of, of dispute that's been along pretty much as long as we've been human species. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, however, I think technology and where we are in our advancements in the world, which is a wonderful thing, at the same time you can have everything customized to you mm -hmm. and to those who look like you, talk like you, think like you. So I can live in the right neighborhoods what I want to. I can go in my education, my schools, mm -hmm. everything. My, um, my social life can all be you know, tater tailored to how I want it to be. I can, my television you know, um, selection of mm -hmm. channels, um, the movies. So the information that I take in, who I so interact mm -hmm. with socially, our workplaces you know, mm -hmm. are more diverse. But even then, it's to the common goal. And I could just still you know, not know how to actually get along with you in order to support mm -hmm. that. But that's where we find in organizations, particularly where the start is, because that's our most diverse settings right now are organizations. So it is both part of our advancement in the world, mm -hmm. but it's also the fact that that's how we're hardwired as human beings. We think that people who are look like us, talk like us, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> people, you know, of course, you know. We so, hold it the mirror. I'm beautiful. Exactly, <gasps> so are you. <laughs> exactly. What's beautiful is look what's look like right. me. What's right is what thinks like, you know, thinks, um, who thinks like mm -hmm. I do. So um, we're all tribal people in that way. And it sounds like you're saying, you mentioned technology. It sounds mm -hmm. like we have the ability to create what the MIT Media Lab once called the daily me. Yeah, And so exactly. we have a daily me in everything we do. And Absolutely. we can have our little customized world channel. Exactly. That's exactly. One of the things that we're talking about in the course that we do, do talk about mm -hmm. social media particularly. And how do we use social media to have online conversations that are civil and reasonable arguments mm -hmm. rather than shutting people down and um, you know and bullying people online right. or just um, just deleting things right. rather than trying to get to what the other's perspective is and coming to new ways of knowing mm -hmm. new ways of thinking new ways of being one of the things I find interesting is this notion of what we mm -hmm. what I am and in advancing inclusion you identify what you call eight key diversity dimensions mm -hmm. which are race gender ethnicity, organizational role slash function, age, sexual orientation, mental and physical ability, and religion. Um, why don't we talk a little bit more about those? And mm -hmm. if we could start with one I'm just particularly curious about, because I don't usually think of organizational role function as being you know, uh, and a, a dividing point. Right. Well, you know, when we talk about those many, many different dimensions of human differences, that's really what diversity is about. And when we talk about class differences, mm -hmm. they usually play out in organizations as your role and function. Mm -hmm. So we know that the same if you were, um, you know, a staff individual and in your team, you know, that you got along with it, the next day that you became the CEO and you sat down there for lunch, mm -hmm. 
people would treat you differently. Yeah. You know, they would they would filter information the um, way it comes to you. The power the power that you would have would mm -hmm. be different, and so it does shift relationships. So we do know that there are um, prototypes in any organization. A prototype is you know, who is going to be most successful, who's going to get right. promoted, who's going to have an ease of expression mm -hmm. and ideas when they're there and um, get those um, pr um, promoted as well. Mm -hmm. And so the closer you are to that prototype, then the more it is that you're, you're able to be included. So when we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about how do the many different dimensions of diversity, mm -hmm. you know, um, like race, gender, age, um, class differences, mm -hmm. et cetera, how do they get access to that support? How do they have informal and formal power? How do they get into mm -hmm. that comment so that the prototype shifts? Well, you know, you mentioned class, and mm -hmm. we have this great myth, of course, that America has no classes. Absolutely, absolutely. And <laughs> I think we see this a lot in political contests where mm -hmm. everything from that person's got a college education, we shouldn't trust them, exactly. suddenly emerge and you say, but isn't isn't education yeah. a good thing? Don't we want exactly. our leaders to be educated? Exactly. And you realize if you listen a little more, you're you're seeing a little edge of this this class. Absolutely, and you you said it so well. In class in our country, it is really a topic that we don't talk about, and we assume that the middle class is really where everyone is and right. the buffer, you know, um, kind of class. But really. Um, when we unravel what middle mm -hmm. class means and what middle class values right. are, you know, that was very apparent in the 1950s and 60s mm -hmm. when we had the television shows, even like <laughs> Donna Reed and Leave it to Beaver, Whoa. that kind of showed us what the classic American right. family was. But that is no more, you know, and because of that class, which typically is unbundled through occupation, mm -hmm. your income, right. income, and the Pew Research just did a study and said that middle class was from 45000 to 145000 and that's oh, usually that's for a, a family range. of four. It is a huge range because you have lower up, uh, lower middle, middle middle, right. and upper middle, you know, but even then, think about who do you know, you know, a family of four that can live on $45,000, yeah. you know, so that, and then prestige bundles in there, mm -hmm. Pre prestige, I mean, last, last mm -hmm. name or your family heritage. Right. So class is something that we generally don't talk about, and we assume everyone is striving to have middle class, but that's not true anymore as well. That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, so these different attributes, mm -hmm. do they layer in any particular order? And maybe that gets into some of your research of mm -hmm. how do we self-identify? You know, for example, yeah. do, do you or I, do we identify first with being female? Do we identify first with being oh. from a neighborhood? Do we... Excellent question, because that's it, just where we are in terms of the cutting edge around the scholarship in this area. Mm -hmm. The traditional approaches to differences did take, um, treat them as if they were um, separate entity, you know, like separate entities mm -hmm. that form this kind of uniform things, but they're not. You know, we know, like, for example, my bl black or African-American didn't walk into the room, then my female, right. <laughs> then my, you know, then um, uh, my ethnicity, then my age. All of those are bundled. So what we know is that it's all relational. Mm -hmm. You know, there's women because they're men and men because, you know, that's how we, de they're, mm -hmm. they're not discrete. You know, they're complex at, um, parts of our identity and they all come together. You know, so it's it's far more complex and layered and nuanced mm -hmm. than we ever thought. You know, we talk like the self 2.0. You yeah. Know. Well, I, uh, just on a personal note, I, I often wonder about that because mm -hmm. I lived um, in an island as a kid and I was the only, in my, in my preschool and kindergarten, I was one of the few pallid, fish belly white, yeah. and therefore very <laughs> ugly, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, non-Spanish speaking kids. Yeah. And then we moved north and everyone was kind of pale skinned and spoke Spanish, but yeah. I still, yeah saw myself in this other lens and I mm -hmm. so that idea of how you identify with to me is just like absolutely you hit it in the sense that those dimensions of diversity are signifying of our power and the relation the hierarchical mm -hmm. relationship because we do tend to put it as good bad up down yes. you know and depending on then who's the majority culture that you can feel like an other you know yeah. and in other places you are not the other your and majority, as a kid, majority. You're like, Ooh. exactly exactly <laughs> Exactly. What does um, the research show about 
how the context shifts and how we shift with it is. Yeah. I mean, well, do what we, we shown there's shift? a gap, you know, because we're not we haven't kept up with the kind of the competencies and the the new ways of knowing and thinking. You know what we know about um, the human behavior and what we know about the self mm -hmm. and how we're constructed is still very much in the 1960s, 1970s models, right. which is why when we have these conversations about race and gender mm -hmm. or diversity and inclusion, people think, okay, check that one off. You know, I'm respectful. I'm civil to people. I, you know, I respect differences. But it's far more than that because we do have to have the competencies and skill sets mm -hmm. to navigate our increasingly multicultural world. Where do we get those? Well, that's, again, you know, <laughs> workshops like these, you know, is where we try to look at right. those competencies because we assume that people have them and they don't, right. you know, because we do not know how to manage differences well. Where our, our brain is hardwired mm -hmm. not to manage differences well. Our decision-making process, you know, we, um, we rely on a set of, you know, uh, processes mm -hmm. and thinking patterns that are evolutionary advantage, like um, pattern recognition right. and emotional tagging and using heuristics. But those don't serve us well when we're talking about diversity mm -hmm. because it, it gives us kind of a, a, a mental set. Right. And we have to be able to know then the, um, when to use that and when not to use it. And so the competencies like how to communicate effectively across mm -hmm. differences, how to hold multiple realities, mm -hmm. perspectives, identities, how to s remain curious, how to move mm -hmm. from certainty to curiosity. You know? well, do you think most people know there are, it's okay to be curious about a difference? Or are we so conditioned that we shut down and we get weird behavior because mm -hmm. curiosity has now been squashed? Uh, well, that is exactly what's happening, particularly in our country. That's when we talk about things being politically correct. Right. You know, um, we do mean that there is kind of a, a, a socially responsive, a socially approved mm -hmm. response or way of thinking. And what people are struggling with is if they don't think that way, then I still have to say it, except I've got this thing going on in my head yeah. when it comes up because I'm wondering why. Instead of creating some natural learning laboratories, if mm -hmm. you will, about our life experiences so that we can um, be a little bit more experiential, a little bit right. more comfortable, a little bit more emotionally resilient mm -hmm. and let people make mistakes around this. Right. I mean, I think having differences is really good because if everyone were the same, you would have a very boring and gray. Absolutely. And, you know, That's how we world. get to creativity, innovation. You know, all of those things don't happen without diversity. Mm -hmm. And so we will really stagnate ourselves indiv as individuals, you know, our relationships, our mm -hmm. country, if we don't know how to manage diversity well. Where does our self-identity come from? You know, you know, everyone I think does identify themselves in some way. Mm -hmm. it, it may change over time, but where? How does that originally yeah. originate? Like, is it something in us? Do we get taught that? Is it? We do we do. change the outside world, or is it something that? We start with a set of, you know, um, qualities or traits or characters, then we're socialized into that whole process. And what we know about things like race and gender mm -hmm. and all those, we're we don't do a good job of socializing them. The same processes that we would use for our intellectual socialization, you know, mm -hmm. process, or even our social, like how to, you know, to, to integrate and interact with others. That socialization process doesn't happen for our own racial identity, for our own gender identity. How, how would it happen? Like, give me an example of what would be what happens now versus what would be a way mm -hmm. to do it be different well let's race is probably an easy one to do okay. and, and certainly gender because we have a lot of information yeah. about and those obvious but visible differences exactly and those are the visibility around that so for example as growing up as an african-american mm -hmm. woman you know i may see myself you know um as first of all identifying with the dominant culture so mm -hmm. I'm old enough that when I saw, you know, television or when I read the right. books or when in school, you know, everything was based on white European norm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know that I have, you know, hey, that doesn't look like right, me, right. but I'm trying <laughs> to be like that, you know. Um, did, did, so do you remember, did it come on to you all of a sudden? Like, did you, the kids have a moment where they go, aha? Uh -huh. Yeah, it does, you know, and we call that the encounter experience. Mm -hmm. There usually is either you, you, there's a book that you read or somebody says something right. to you or it could even just be an aha insightful thing of after seeing a movie or you know age development you think mm -hmm. wait a minute 
this isn't right. You know, I this I have been trying to be this square in this <laughs> circle, and right. it's not working. And so you start to then think of, then who am I? Mm -hmm. And then you start to look and go more um, immersed in right. your own identity, your own culture. Mm -hmm. That happens with women. You know, yeah. then they go into women's movement things, or or it happens with you know. Um, you know, LGBT, you know, mm -hmm. they go into immersed in their identity so that they can learn there's a sense of belonging that right. comes and sense of identity. And then out over time, you know, it could also mean that they can internalize mm -hmm. that, put on another part of their identity and see it more layered and mm -hmm. nuanced. So I'm going to say part of okay. self-identity building is creating a sense of us versus them. So this thing we say we don't want to happen is yeah. almost a natural part of yeah. how we develop. Absolutely. We have so much work to do for ourselves. You know, it's kind of like even with adolescents, so when they do sh with the parent, you oh, know, yeah, things. Yeah, oh, painful you know, that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're not me yet. So, well, you know, you suddenly turn from being, you know, the know knowing everything and yeah. wonderful and good to not knowing anything right. and being terrible, you know, and because they are pu um, pulling out their own identity. And similarly, that happens for us around race, around our gender, around our sexual orientation. Some of those less to, um, to agree because mm -hmm. we grow up with an assigned. We think, okay, you know, this is what everybody is, and if I'm not, then I have to do that struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, it is a process, and it does set it up to right. be that way. And because, again, then we get technology and um, where we are as a mm -hmm. nation, you know, so we can stay in our camp, you know. Right. We can be ethnocentric and culturally myopic mm -hmm. in our thinking, meaning that we believe our culture is the standard for everyone else and relevant to everyone right. else. I think we see that in age division sometimes. Absolutely. You know, I think of Absolutely. millennials, for yeah. example, who yeah. are quite certain what they do is the best way to do it. And then exactly. I hear members of, say, the boomers, especially the boomers, you know, yeah. they're obviously wrong. And the exactly. only wrong criteria is age. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it really is more about differences because we do have different perspectives around work ethics, yeah. around what success means. Mm -hmm. You know, we did have a shared well-being concept before. Everybody was kind of on the same page of what success yeah. was, what quali good quality of life was about. Not that much anymore today. Mm -hmm. that, that becomes very interesting because mm -hmm. we've got people identifying who they are, and that's mm -hmm. very good personal development. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's probably very threatening to people who are Absolutely. over here in this other camp, exactly. and then we don't even have this overarching agreement on yeah. what we all want in exactly. the world. I mean, and we don't know how to live, coexist with all of those differences, mm -hmm. you know, without trying to say, okay, this is what it has to be, or being so siloed. And we don't really want that because that's also going to interrupt our growth as right. a nation and as our personal growth as well. Well, where do we try to bring some of these things back together. Is it a workplace mm -hmm. challenge? Is it a community challenge? It is a mm -hmm. government leadership challenge? Where? Yeah. It really is all. I think organizations are probably ahead of the game because mm -hmm. they see it as a business imperative. Right. You know, they see it as if we don't leverage these differences to drive our business mm -hmm. outcomes, you know, that it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so they do have done that for a while. Mm -hmm. In our communities, not so much because we can, you know, stay in our, um, we stay, isolated in our right. communities. Our living patterns in the United States still show that we are very, mm -hmm. still segregated. Our social patterns are even more so. Let me ask you a question. You say we're still segregated. Mm -hmm. And we looked at these eight key factors. How do we s segregate? Is it by income, by race, by class? Usually by, by income, you know, and then because of the disparities with income, then it usually turns out to be also by race. Right, so it's not well. really race is the thing that divides where we live. It just happens to be an outcome of a, a totally separate yeah. set well, of things. Well, they're all so linked. You know, when you were talking about at the beginning, you know, the how these di the dimensions of my yeah. diversity, are they layered or the nuanced? Similarly, as they interact, they're going to interact that, you know, w they're they're like those old pop beads that they used to have. <laughs> I remember those you know, little kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those <laughs> pop beads. So they, they're linked, at, you know, inextricably linked uh -huh. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We mentioned um, organizations a mm -hmm. little bit ago, and you know, recently two industries have really been slammed hard for their mm -hmm. mm, mononess: mm -hmm. <laughs> the tech industry mm -hmm. and the film industry. Right. And one of the things I wonder about that is that they're both creating products consumed by mm -hmm. everyone. And 
how how does that lack of diversity mm -hmm. in what's being who's the producers ripple down into how we perhaps yeah. interact or see diversity? Well, it's great, again a great question. Usually because in those industries, even when there's creating, almost in everyone, mm -hmm. over time in organizations, what's happened is that we've had things that have been traditions, they have been conveniences, mm -hmm. preferences, someone's preferences, usually males, yes. you know, <laughs> or the, the people who are in the dominant in the work for, you know, in the workforce uh -huh. for so long. Those traditions, those re, um, conveniences, those preferences have turned into requirements, mm. you know. And so when those get muddied mm -hmm. about um, the criteria of who's the best, you know, like even when you think about the film and, and the Oscars, you know, right. when they say the Oscars so white, you know, and they're saying, okay, well, is it the Oscars that are so white or is it just that there aren't enough people of diverse who meet that criteria? Right. That's, I mean, that's a really hard question. Right? Yeah, and that's part of the us versus them kind of thing. But it's because if we unbundle that criteria, we unbundle who's voting, mm -hmm. you know, we would find that there is someone's preferences, conveniences, and traditions right loaded up into that, that systemically then have prevented other people from, from entering right. that, who don't look like me, talk like me, think like me, or consider this right, to be right. art. So in technology, that, yeah. that's another space that has been extremely slammed. And mm -hmm. um, I worked in the tech industry for a long time, yeah. and I was very involved in science, technology, engineering, and math education, right. and how to make that more diverse, because it's mm, pretty much white, male, exactly. male, white. Exactly. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, <laughs> right. and uh, you know, I, I think what you just said really resonates because it's it's sort of like what yeah. is done becomes a requirement, and I think about something as simple as Legos. Exactly. And when my daughter was little, really little, she played with Primos and Duplos, right? And they were yeah. yellow and red and happy colors, and she liked them, and they had little flowers. Mm -hmm. And then she got old enough, and they were now Legos, and she stopped playing with them, and I was like. But you like building things, you know. Why, why did what happened there? And she yeah. said, "They're ugly. They're dark blue, and they're mm. dark brown, yeah. and they have cars. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have flowers anymore. Yeah. And it's sort of like we've taken, oh, but, you know, this, someone's preference. Th th they, uh, cars are a preference, yeah. so that becomes technology, not exactly. the act of." being a technologist, and I, I would exactly. imagine the medical school, you must struggle with this a lot. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that we're trying to, you know, help to advance, because we do know, even in the publications, what the research agendas get created, all of those things do have unconscious bias that you know, mm -hmm. flows into the work. We have studies that say, you know, that, you know, even with grants, mm -hmm. and you would think that it was going to be done on the merit of that, but who's reviewing those right. grants, it seeps in there. I was reading an anthology about racism and mm -hmm. is it inherent and, and one of the um, pieces in there talked about color blindness and there being really no such thing even mm -hmm. when you try to completely right. avoid it 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 yeah. still seeps in and that somehow by offering a range of things that might appeal to different people you're almost more balanced than trying to be so neutral exactly. you appeal to no one Exactly, exactly. And because the neutral, trying to be neutral, serve no one, that is really just about trying to wipe it away. But we really mm -hmm. do have to struggle with this because we are wired, you know, and th there's a lot of great body of work right now on unconscious bias, Talk implicit a bit about bias. That. Yeah, we, what we do know is that, again, uh, uh, how our brain works, that we are, you know, we have these preferences, mm -hmm. the work of, um, uh, Mahajarin Banaji and mm -hmm. Anthony Greenwald mm -hmm. who did the implicit association test which you can go online and take millions literally right. over 13 million people have taken it, and they have all different categories of dimensions but there we our, our brain is wired that we will go for preference on that and once we do that you know we have to train ourselves mm -hmm. you know we have to so it's always kind of like you know, like your car tires, you know, that need alignment every right. now and you then because they're they're going to go in one way and they're going to go towards that way that right. it's 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 like us or we do mm -hmm. have a preference. Right. And so when we do that, and if we do that unchecked, we do have, all of us have unconscious mm -hmm. bias. Yeah. Well, you see that, I know you, I've seen research in classrooms mm -hmm. that, in science classrooms in, mm -hmm. you know, elementary and, and high school where teachers have no idea they're calling on boys. Yeah. Exactly. They yeah. just, they're not doing it intentionally. They have exactly. no idea. Exactly. And also giving more discipline to boys yes. than they are to the girls. You know, we were talking about even this morning how that, um, in the classroom, that how that, that same thread 
continues to letters of references. There are gender difference in letters of recommendation. There are. Really? Right. So that when there are studies that have been done, it looks at letters of recommendation uh -huh. for women versus men, and the and the men will have great emphasis on their competencies and their skills and mm -hmm. how they apply to that work. Right. Women is all about their their nurturing skills, their teamwork. They've even had um, people that's phrase in there. Oh, our wives know each other and our kids play together. You're you know, kidding. she's a really good person. You know, so they talk about <laughs> you know these kinds of informations in letters of rec recommendation for jobs. So yes, oh we know gosh. that it does seep in there. You know, we know that even with ethnic sounding names on mm -hmm. a resume, you know, people will you know um, you know think okay, they look at that and they you know, we don't want that. You know. They do unconsciously. I mean, they unconsciously. Would, if you call them on it, they would probably say, "What do you mean? I don't." I exactly. Don't do that. I was looking at their comments. I was reading this, or it's looking at that. And of course, you can always do that. Right. You know, you can. You know, you can always find the more qualified individual mm -hmm. by looking at that. Mm -hmm. But what we do is like we have these. Like if we have seven boxes that mean qualified and qualified mm -hmm. is qualified and qualified, then we create this eighth box that's called more qualified. And guess what more qualified looks like? It's the things that like me. Yes. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's any accident that, you yeah. know, if you look at startups, yeah. they're all funded by slightly younger versions of the, the exactly. venture capitalists who are funding them. Exactly. It's like, mm. yeah, They're wonderful people. They look yeah. like me, talk like me, act like me. <laughs> that's know? right. Well, let me ask you, you know, I, diversity is here. With, I mean, I mean, diverse differences among people. It's, it, it's mm -hmm. a reality. If you're putting together a team, mm -hmm. what brings you the best result? Should you look for try to be sort of blind to all differences and look only at certain sets of competencies? Or do you look at differences and different strengths they might bring yeah. to get you to a different place? How, how, how do you well, look at that? Well, it depends on the task, you know, know, because we do know that um, heterogeneous groups are more creative and more, you know, can be more productive in mm -hmm. the long run, you know. But if we're doing mm -hmm. routine tasks, mm -hmm. you know, homogeneous groups, depends on, again, what's the business objective, what's the goal right. of the mission, or what's the task. But we do know for innovation, creativity, Definitely heterogeneous groups. Let me go back and pick groups. on technology again then for a second. You know, exactly. you, Google, Microsoft, Apple, they, mm -hmm. they've they all taken a lot of hits in the last exactly. year. People have gone and looked. Microsoft's come out and said, oh, yes, we promise we're going to try to do better. Yeah. I mean, is that good business sense? It's, it will be certainly for me. It is. It makes good business sense and sense, C-E-N-T-S, yeah. <laughs> because we do know it drives the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the medical field, which I you know well mm -hmm. I mean yeah. that's changed a great deal in the yeah. last 25 years right. was that intentional and how has that changed sort of the outcome of medical situations mm -hmm. by diversifying mm -hmm. the medical health care yeah. industry it really has there's a great deal of effort that's been made on um, in the in the field of medicine and in medical education mm -hmm. you know to have it more diverse because we do know um, that we have health equity issues, health mm -hmm. disparities in other mm -hmm. words, that um, we have unequal access, unequal treatment, unequal outcomes right. and we want and we want to change that and to do that we need all of the collective wisdom and so we do right. need um, the diversity within our um, you know the medical field and mm -hmm. professionals as well as people who are educating to, to get us there. Well, what can say technology and film learn from the medical field? Mm -hmm. Well you know I think tech, we've always had this idea that technology is just a task and it's you know it's it's kind of neutral and right. free but it's really not because again who is doing the work who's doing the um, the um, it becomes you know that's where the creativity and innovation comes. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're almost out of time. So I actually want to ask okay. on a really hard question, I guess, and mm -hmm. but one we I don't think any of us have the answer to. But I'm curious, based on the trends you've seen, what you see in research, what we understand now, if we had this conversation in four years, or in ten years, or in eighteen years, would we be having the same conversation? Absolutely not. You know, in diversity, we know that if we always do what we always did, we won't always get what we always got. You know, because <laughs> it's very, very different. You know, um, there's a wonderful um, video, short video that's um, actually been updated every year for since about 2010. Mm -hmm. It's done by a company that's outside of, uh, I think it's, it's right in Boston, mm -hmm. called Shift 
happens, and it really, <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful while you, as yeah. you say that, but they, it's called Did You Know, mm -hmm. and we, we showed um, the 26th version in class mm -hmm. and discussed it, but it does talk about the fact that we are, you know, trying to educate folks on problems that we, you know, that we don't know um, that exist with, you know, with technologies that we don't even have right, right now. We have jobs that were created in, you know, um, now in 2010 that didn't exist even three years yeah. ago. You know, so um, they we're changing very rapidly. Now, I wonder if that will change how we behave. Like, I think, in some ways, I think things mm -hmm. are better. Like, people talk openly. You, mm -hmm. you, you know, a, a gay couple can hold hands in public and have mm -hmm. children, and, and yeah. no one yeah. has angst about it. We have, you know, interracial couples. You know, mm -hmm. High school, I think the differences yeah. are more football team versus mm -hmm. yeah. bookish Which rather are, than, yeah, exactly. than skin color. So that seems like a good thing, but at the same time, We've got, you know, people killing each other all over. Yeah, yeah. We st we st there we do need those competencies and skills, you know. And I think the younger generation, because they are more demographically diverse, do have you know what I call kind of the under the table skills mm -hmm. that we are responsible in helping to make them tabletop and honing in on. But what the problem is, you know, many of our educators, and that's not just very educators. I consider myself right. one. But um, with people, we have to learn, you know the tabletop skills as well. And mm -hmm. so it's going to be kind of a bi-directional learning. Right. We all are learning on this. This, this is an area where I say I'm going to be learning six months after I'm in the grave yeah. because it is so vast. Well, I'm going to ask you to give one last thought to people. If you're holding up a mirror to yourself and you're saying, you know, maybe I do react with biases and I don't really like that yeah. in myself, what, what's the one most important thing I can do to change. Yeah, and first of all, it's just owning that. That is so good. I mean, when people <laughs> say that, I really do believe and know that we are all racist, sexist, classist, ages, homophobic, <laughs> all those things. Don't. It's just a matter of degree. Uh -huh. And our life work is to really just try to lessen that degree. But to come with a sense of curiosity about that, mm -hmm. you know, and understand all those social loadings that have been put in there to, right. to, to make us the way we are. And then when we know better, we do better. Oh, I, I love that. So it's awareness, it's curiosity. Yeah, and it's acting with intention and awareness, too. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much, Dr. Thank Holm, you, for being Teresa. here with me today. Mm -hmm. It's been a great conversation. It and really uh, I hope we can maybe we can talk again in four years and see how the conversation's different. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is Teresa Martin from Lower Cape TV. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.